I'm Reverend David Castro. See, we gotta, we gotta make it leap off the page. We gotta have a sheer the hearts of, of, the, of the hearer. We gotta, you know, bring about the, 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 the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit lives, you know. I'm Bishop Jesse Evans, the Spirit is real. And the power of the original substance of the divine principle is when it is preached. Not only taught, but when it is preached and, and men and women are inspired to, to take on a greater role in their Christian walk. Amen. So the whole concept of the cross, yes, the cross became a necessity. Say, say necessity. I want you to have say necessity. I want you to have that in your mind. Yes, the, the cross became a necessity. Yes, the blood that was shed on Calvary still reaches to the highest mountain and it still flows to the lowest valleys. Still gives us strength from day to day. It shall never lose its power. Hey, that's the blood of Jesus. But the reality is, you can get blood without losing your own life. You can get a kind of blood without having to sacrifice your own life. That Jesus was forgiven sins even before he shed one ounce of blood on Calvary. Every time he healed, he said, your sins are forgiven. You... I think you heard that. Jesus was forgiving sins before he died on Calvary. There was a remission of sin. There was a forgiveness of sin, even in the miraculous works of Jesus. So I want us to keep that clear in our mind that, that the primary course was to bring about restoration of the human family. That's the, that's the unification of thought. That's why True Father is trying to drive home. He's asking us to open our minds, open our hearts. But yet there is still the value. The, 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 the value of the crucifixion is that Jesus did not. That Jesus did not. Just simply live for himself. No. But he lived for the sake of others. Yeah. And he died on Calvary. Yeah. But imagine if he had been accepted. If your son or your daughter is accepted by your loved ones, they don't show their highest esteem or appreciation by killing your son and daughter. That's right. Lord. Yeah. A lot of times we don't think in that context. We, Amen. But Jesus was Jesus. But we are Jesus. Hey, glory. So what's the path? Was Jesus' path to the cross the only possibility? It was against God's providence. God prepared Jesus' family, Judaism and Israel, to receive and believe in Jesus, as we said. When we look at Jesus' words, we see that he, Jesus himself, wanted to be believed in and accepted. In. And Jesus testified that God's will was that Israel believe in Jesus. Let us look at John chapter 6, verse 28 to 9. They said unto they said, then they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has, that ye kill him, that ye reject him. No, it says that ye believe on him whom he has sent. It caused Jesus anguish. Look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, how Jesus cried out on the, on the very vigil of his denial, of his, the very vigil of his death. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and he would not. Would not. My Lord, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He's on a hillside there in the garden of, of Gethsemane, overlooking the city of Jerusalem, the ancient walls surrounding the city. He's there looking from a high place at the city of Jerusalem. He we, he's weeping. Yeah. Jesus, my Lord and Savior, is brought to tears. He's, he's anguishing. Yeah. After all he had done, all the miracles, all, after all of the marvels of God, he still had a disbelief. Yeah. He still had a people who would not accept him. Oh, when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. Yeah. But now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. 
and they shall not leave in the one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So Jesus is filial prayer, his sonship prayer, Jesus is filial prayer at Gethsemane. Let this cup pass. Matthew chapter 26, verses 38 through 45, beginning there, it says, Then saith he unto them, then saith Jesus unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of Satan. So why did Jesus pray, let this cup pass? Because he was sorrowful to death, for they were rejecting God. They did not pray from human weakness. God's original plan was that he would end all sin and evil and build the kingdom of God. It was God's will that Jesus be accepted. But when the disciples slept, and there was no faith any longer in the people. He was betrayed into the hands of sinners. Now let's look at the first martyr, Stephen's testimony. In Acts, found in Acts chapter 7, verses 51 Ooh, through 52. Go on, Dr. Jenkins, please read that, that for us, Dr. Jenkins. Uh-huh. Persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now become the betrayers and murderers. Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Not only did you betray him, but you murdered him. Was this providence? Was this providence completed? In the, whole con in the whole context of, of Jesus being denied, rejected, and submitted and subjugated to an ignominious death on the gibbet of the cross. Oh my God! Was the original providential plan of God and sin in his only begotten Son completed in that act of crucifixion? In that act of crucifixion? Because even after his death on Calvary, original sin is still passed on to the children of the saved. All generations are in need of baptism. How is it that two people who are saved, a man and a woman, husband and wife, who are saved, born of the spirit and washed in his blood, are still bringing forth, are still conceiving and bringing forth children born in sin and shaped in iniquity? Sin still exists in the same. The apostle Paul wrote as a saved Christian that his body served the law of sin. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Dr. Jenkins, could you take us to Romans chapter 7, verses 21 and 25, and read that passage for our audience. Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25. Romans chapter 7, 21 through 25. 
I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. But with the flesh, the law of sin, we've been saved, but we're still sinning. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, but still lost, living in a world of darkness. How is that? Was this providence completed? Why are we still awaiting the redemption of our bodies? As we heard in Romans, as we read in Romans 8, 23. Romans chapter 8, verse 23, Dr. Jim. Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Now this statement of the tent maker of Tarsus, Saul, who told Jesus it would be all right if he changed his name from Saul to Paul. That this particular account that we're reading in, the, in his epistle or his letter to the Romans is a post-resurrectional pericope. It's a post-resurrectional statement in which he's saying, I am still awaiting the redemption of, of my body. Jesus has been crucified on Calvary. But Paul said, I'm still anguishing. I'm still anguishing because my body is in need of redemption. Amen. Though we are saved, we still have sin. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Dr. Jacobs. John, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Chapter, first epistle of John, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Oh, if, we say, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive sins, forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Thank you very much. So that's a correction on that. First John, First John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, because we know you want to have that for further catechesis or further teaching. Amen. Now, is there another redemption? Is there another redemption after this spiritual redemption accomplished on Calvary? The remission of sins, yes. On Calvary, Jesus shed his blood. There is that remission of sin, not, not just for one, but for all. Not once, but for all. It is universal. Hello. That that's spiritual salvation is universal, not just for Christians alone. Christians do not have a commodity, do not have a monopoly on salvation. Thank God we don't. Amen. That Jesus died once and for all. That's what the word says. The word says died for the for the Muslim, for the Hindu, for the for the Hindi. Died for the Zoroastrian. Died for the the Jewish person. Died once and for all. That's the universality of that spiritual salvation. But Jesus' is a desire, God's desire for Jesus was not only to save us spiritually, but also physically, holistically. So it says, the redemption of the body is yet to come. And we read that, Romans 8, 3. Now from this evidence, the ultimate purpose to end all sin and bring all into the kingdom was not fulfilled. I just explained it. That is why Jesus said he will come again. He will return to wipe away every tear and bring evil to an end. If everything had been completed on, the, on, on Calvary, there would be no need for a second coming. There would be no need for the Lord of the second advent. Would you agree that once the, once the contract is finished, building your house, there's no need for the contractor to come back. Unless he did some bogus work. And you've got problems with the construction. Once everything is completed, there's no need for, 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 the, for the contractor to come back. You don't want to see him again, in fact, because he might be trying to get some more money. 
That's why Jesus will come, will have to say, will come again, he will return to wipe away every tear and bring evil to an end. So what was the, so why was the ultimate purpose not fulfilled? There had to be a reason. There, has, there had to be a reason why that ultimate purpose of God for his only begotten son, Jesus, was not fulfilled. Understand what we're saying here. There's more to be done. There's, there's something to be accomplished with the return of the Lord. Because the people to whom God sent the Messiah, the anointed one, did not recognize that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, that he was the anointed one, the one they were waiting for. So let us look at salvation through the redemption by the cross and the purpose of Jesus' second coming. In the book, of, we, we see seemingly two contrasting uh, prophecies, if you will. And it's all based on, on free will. What choice will we make? Sometimes we probably have cursed God because he gave us a free will. It would have been so much easier if God had told us what to do and he had done it all for us and we would not have gone left when he told us to go right. But then a lot of us would be upset because we would say that Jesus is trying, God is trying to micromanage our lives. All right. And trying to deny me the right to be who I am. Like Popeye said, uh, I am that I am, that's all that I am. I'm Popeye the sailor man. Woo woo. You know. <laughs> so some of us in our in our in our our pension. To, uh, and our craving for, for individuality and um, uh, our own unique personality, we're glad that we have free will. Imagine if God had not given that to us. We'd all be robots. We'd all be the same. But thank God we do have free will. But uh, sometimes our free will can get us in a whole lot of trouble. Yeah. Now look at, let us look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, Dr. Jacobs. Isaiah chapter 53. This is a famous passage that we hear during um, the uh, Holy Week service during Lent. Isaiah 53, verses 3, 4, 5, and 6. Mm -hmm. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned away every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. By his stripes we are healed. That's, that's one prophecy. That is, that, that, that is the prophetic word of Isaiah 53. What happens when we reject the Messiah, the Christ? takes upon himself our iniquities, our infirmities. He takes upon himself our sin. The Bible says that he was like us in all things but sin, but he became sin. Yes. Which means he took upon himself the chastisement. Jesus' physical body was given as a ransom. Salvation of the Spirit is offered to all who believe. Christ returns to deliver us from this body of death. We saw that in Romans 8, 23. What about Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. My, my, my. There it is. There it is. So we see this biblical tradition of, of what we call dual prophecy, seeming antithetical, contradictory prophecies based upon man and woman's free will. For example, if we look at uh, Israel, look at the bottom of the chart there. To my left, huh? Look at Israel. When it came to Moses and the 12 tribes of Israel. And Moses, as you know, uh, called by God, called by the Lord God, Yahweh, the one, the name that means I am, that I am, I am who I am, Yahweh. Yahweh, who, is, who has liberated the people of Israel, the children of Israel, before, from 400 years of bondage in Egypt land. Because Egypt, led by Pharaoh, 
would not let God's people go. The Lord God told Moses, go down. Way down in Egypt's land and tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. And so Moses, oh God, we know what God will not stretch our part of the sea. And the, the children of Israel marched through the Red Sea. On the way to the promised land, a journey that should have taken no more than three weeks. Some say two weeks, but took 40 years. Talk about going around in circles. So many of us as Christians are going around in circles. Up and down, all around. Because we're not obeying the commands of God. So, so the, the, the prophecy was, so the dual prophecy here, if, if, if the children of Israel had listened to the commands of God, they would have gone, they would have made it to the promised land on time. But by disobedience, so many of them died in the desert. It says that Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that reached the promised land. That, that lineage, what do you say about that? Because the other 12, when Moses sent 12 leaders from the tribes of Israel to go and reconnoiter the land, to, to spy on the land, yeah. 10 of them came back with a new report, saying the people are like giants. Yeah. Oh, the land is overflowing with milk and honey, pomegranates and figs, but there's a problem. It all looks good on the other side, and we can just get over to the other side. But there's a problem there. There's a chasm. There's a void. There's a vacuum. We looked across the Jordan River, and we saw these men who look like giants. And we seem to be like grasshoppers. But Caleb and Joshua came back with a good report. They said, we can conquer the land. We can overcome our enemies. We can cross them over. Oh, I got chills up here to talking about this. He says, with God, all things are possible. Oh, no mountain too high enough, no river too wide enough, no valley too low enough. We can make it. We can make it. Hallelujah. But you see, they were in the minority. The majority had all that cast of them, had already twisted the minds of the people. Died in the desert. They died in their own sins because they made a choice, a conscientious choice. And even before that, you know, Adam and Eve, before, long before Moses, Adam and Eve told them, the Lord God told them you can have anything in the, tree, in the garden, just don't eat from the fruit of the tree in the, in the middle of the garden. And then the devil came along, Satan came along, that, that talking snake. Intelligence thing. Anybody seen a talking snake with intelligence that knows the will of God? You heard that in, you heard that in, in Reverend Sykes' presentation? That's a weird snake if you ask me. I wonder how many feet did it have. Dr. Ross, you're a doctor. I wonder how many feet did that serpent have? How many tongues did it have? Because it how many brains did it have? It, that, was a, that was a snake that knew too much for its own ilk, for its own kind. It, Lord God said, if you listen to the words I've given you, you'll live. But if you don't live, if you, if you don't listen to the word, you'll die. That's right. See, they had the choice. They had a decision made. Follow the commandments of God, you'll live. Don't listen to God. Follow the, follow the word of, of, the, of the serpent, you'll die. So we know what happened. Even Jesus. Jesus, you know, we could if, if the people had accepted Jesus, Jesus could have been the Lord of glory. As we read in Isaiah 9, we can go there. We, Isaiah 9. Out, we've already read Isaiah 9 and 6. Yeah, what would have happened? If the prophecy of the Lord of glory. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. That's why, that's why I love every Christmas season. Handel's Messiah. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. There we go. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God.
the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How could he become that if you're going to hang him on the cross? How does he become that if you're going to nail him to the cross? How shall his government last forever if you kill him? That's the reason for dual prophecies, because God always makes provisions for our freedom. Matthew, Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 13. Come on with me. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That's right, for all the laws and the prophets. Up until John, that's a, that's a, a, a prophecy for the coming of the Messiah the first time. All up to John. So look at this. So we have a prophecy in the Old Testament. The Son of Man must be lifted up. And we see the comparison in the New Testament. Because of the people's disbelief. Remember the children of Israel in the desert growing tired and weary, frustrated, upset with Moses and Aaron and anybody associated with the leadership, with the leadership, with the leadership, and saying, you know, would that we had died. You brought, you brought, us, you brought us out here into this desert. You brought us out into this desert. No water, no food. Man, those were some angry folk. T.L. Barrett, I tell them those were black folk back there in that time. <laughs> Upset and mad and angry because they, their leaders had brought them out to them. We would have rather stayed in, in Egypt when we had three pops and a cop. You had to bring them out to this desert and die. Numbers 21. Read the story to us, Doc. Numbers 21, 5 through 9. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass, that every one that look, every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Wow, and Dr. Michael Ross will tell you that's why the medical profession, the medical profession uses that symbol of the staff with the serpent intertwined around it. Because it becomes a symbol of healing. It's right from the Bible. Many doctors wouldn't admit that, but it's from the Bible. What do we have in what is the New Testament equivalent of that, Dr. Jenkins? where Jesus talks about the Son of Man being lifted up. In summary, yes. when the people who were bitten by the fiery serpents looked upon the bronze serpent that was lifted up, they would be healed. Yes. So in the New Testament, the word says that Jesus will be lifted up and all men will be drawn unto him. And it also says that as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. That's right. I'll draw all men and women unto me. Amen. Thank you, Dr. G. So let's look quickly at the second coming of Elijah and John the Baptist. You heard about this. And we're going to go to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Speaking about, again, we're looking at the second coming of of Elijah. So evidently, if it's a second coming, he must have been around before that. And John the Baptist. Is there a, compar is there a, compar a comparative analysis between the second coming of Elijah and John the Baptist? Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. The last book of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Malachi 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So who was Elijah? Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. We read it in Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. And again, Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 through 14. Let us read it. Everyone read it. Let's read Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 through 13 all together. 
And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Matthew 11, 13 and 14. Let us read that together. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. That's the, that's, that's the conditional tense. And if, if is a conditional word, if. If ifs and ands were pots and pans, the world would be a kitchen. If, if, and if you will receive it, this is Elijah. So the problem is, is that we have failed to connect the dots in our Christian teaching. That's the reality of this. Jesus is saying very clearly, unequivocally, that John the Baptist is the returning Elijah. Did he look like Elijah? Did he have the same DNA as Elijah? Did he have the same hair? Did he come in a chariot out of the clouds? No. Help me, somebody. But Jesus said it. That ought to settle it. That's what we said. That God, God said it. That settled it. John said, however, John said he was not Elijah. Let us go to John chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Let us read this together. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and didn't, and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he said, No. So it's very clear that John denied it all. He says, I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elias, which is also the equivalent of Elisha. Okay, that is Elijah. Look at all the ancient translations of the scriptures, you'll find Elijah. No need of equivocating here. Elias means Elijah. He says, I'm not even a prophet. But look, Jesus says he's more than a prophet. We'll read about that later. So here we are right now. John, the direction that the people would choose. Again, we're talking about the free will. John has to admit who he is in order to direct them to Jesus. John is the one who's believed. He's the son of a high priest, Zechariah, Elizabeth. People are going to believe his lineage. Anything that comes out of John's mouth, the people are going to believe it because John has pedigree. Jesus is a carpenter's son. You know how that is. How are we going to listen to somebody who's educated and seem like they know something? They're going to listen to anyone that's got common sense. So they're not going to listen. So John had a responsibility. His portion of responsibility was to point the chosen people, the people of Israel. Christianity wasn't around at this time. Besides, I should make a parenthetical remark that Jesus, for some of us, we may need to have this awakening. Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Jew. And he wasn't even a rabbi in the sense of being of that ordained ministry. He was a teacher. Rabbi means teacher in Hebrew. But Jesus was not of that uh, Levitical class, if you will. He was a, he was a, he was a, he was a well astute, well knowledge layperson, like we ought to have in all of our churches. And Christ was not his surname, as I told you yesterday. It wasn't his last name. It was his office. It was his position. That was his responsibility. So John, the people were counting on John the Baptist. Now, the direction that the people would go, with, with the direction that the people would choose would be based on John the Baptist. Now, he, here, let's look at John. Let's look at the, the pedigree of John. He had a miraculous birth. It was a miraculous birth of the high priest, Zechariah, because, but because Zechariah was all dried up. Not even Viagra could help his situation. Mary, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's womb was, was like a prune. You eat some of those prunes and they dry. No juice, nothing. So it was a miraculous birth. John, John the Baptist lived an ascetic life. While we, we heard someone talk about that yesterday, he, 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 uh, we heard Dr. Calvin Rice specifically say about John the Baptist. He did an excellent treatise on John the Baptist on yesterday. And his reason today, John the Baptist wore camel's hair and ate wild honey. And, lo and locusts and wild honey. Now, how would you like to have had that for lunch today? <laughs> Dr. Jesus, his messianic status. Is Luke. John chapter 1, 
20 and Luke chapter 3. Luke 315. And the people, and as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. And in John 120. John 1, chapter 1, verse 20. And John confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Not. Plain and simple. Now, look at, now let's contrast John the Baptist's stature to that of Jesus. Jesus was, a car, was of, a, of a carpenter's family, carpenter's son. He was a, had an unlearned youth. A lot of things we don't even know about Jesus. He just disappeared off the scene. He broke the Sabbath. Let us look at that clearly. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, and word, one way, he was always breaking the, the Sabbath, always going up against the establishment. And then hanging out with lepers, prostitutes, pimps, hoes, all of them. Matthew 12, verse 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were in hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn. But when the Pharisees saw it and said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was in hunger and they were with him? that were with him, how he entered the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? And I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple, but if ye had known what that meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. <laughs> the Lord even of the Sabbath. Hallelujah. He's the Lord even of the Sabbath. You see right there, you see, and another, look at Jesus, he was a friend of tax collectors, prostitutes, I told you, pimps and hoes and sinners. Isn't that right, Bishop Ebony Kirk? Am I lying about it? And he claimed to be from heaven. How preposterous. How is he claim to be from heaven? Who are you? Before Abraham was, I am. Come on, man. You ain't even old enough to. And he told people to love him more than their parents. Oh, my gosh. So the people followed John, and this made them doubt Jesus' words, not just about John, but about everything he said and did. So Jesus seemed to be just another man claiming to be the Messiah. Now the mission of, what was the mission of John? It's all linked to the whole coming of the second coming of Elijah. Let us look again at John chapter 1 verse 23. Make, John said, make straight the way of the Lord. In Luke chapter 1 verse 17, we hear the angel, the archangel, yes. announcing the birth of John the Baptist. He says he will go before him. He will name it. That means he will go before the Messiah, the Christ, in the spirit. This is what the archangel said to. The archangel Gabriel said to, to Zachariah. Zachariah. Come on. He will go before the Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah, making ready a people. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord our people prepared. Even Zechariah was told what was his mission. Gosh. Do we need to go any further in that passage? Dr. James, is that enough? No, that's this good. This is not a reincarnation. It was, it was not a reincarnation. Of, the returning Elijah was not a reincarnation. It was a shared mission. We're not reincarnating Jesus as we say to be another Christ. Or a Messiah, we're taking on the same mission. If you take on the mission of Jesus, you are a Christ. If you take on the help me so much. Now, what is the biblical meaning of a second coming? Testimony plus deeds were necessary. Testimony plus deeds were necessary. Jesus said John was Elijah. John denied he was Elijah. Why? The disbelief of John the Baptist. Matthew, this is powerful. Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Even though we've read sections of it, we need to read it again. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 12. And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John the Baptist had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the dead deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news 
the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto them the multitudes concerning John the Baptist. What went ye out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken with the wind? What went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft clothes? Behold, they that wear soft clothes are in king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before, I, before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Matthew chapter 11, 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Who is, this, who is the least in the kingdom? Can you give us any biblical insight? Biblical insight. Matthew 5, 19. Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to break the commandments, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. My gosh. And John was lower than that? Least than the one who breaks the commandments and teaches others to do it? Shall be That's what least? Jesus. John is less than least? Or least? More than least? That's what Jesus said. Good God Almighty. So ignorance, the disbelief of John the Baptist was an ignorance of God's will and providence. John, John failed to inherit Jesus' vision and spirit. He didn't understand Jesus' words and deeds. He worried about his own authority and reputation. And had, he had a conventional expectation of the Messiah. So we need a new perspective on the Bible. We really do. In order to, in order to put new wine into new wineskins, that's what this is, is new wine. And if we, excuse me, if we put it into old wineskins, we're going to bust wide open. Let me say down south, bust wide open. So we have been reading the Bible through an old lens based on a given that John the Baptist fulfilled God's will as a great prophet, that he fulfilled God's will to the end. I think maybe we remember that he fulfilled it to the last, to the end. Right? We should examine our inherited attitude of faith, namely our old wineskins. We should constantly make an effort to stand in the light of faith by searching in both spirit and truth. Now here's new light from Scripture. Reverend Moon's understanding came from Jesus. Jesus revealed John's true mission and the meaning of the second advent. So let us open our hearts in prayer so that God can guide our lives. Kansamida. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you, sir. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup. Asante sana. Thank you. Archbishop George Augustus Sterling Jr. Come on, let's hear it for him.